Hello and welcome to uh, GOMA. I'm Paul Barclay from Big Ideas on ABC RN in Brisbane. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to host this GOMA Talks event. Before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge the land on which we gather today and to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, this is the first of two GOMA Talks events to be held in conjunction with the Cindy Sherman exhibition, which is running until the 3rd of October here at GOMA. I've already been to the exhibition a couple of times. You should make sure you pay a visit if you haven't already. Uh, Cindy Sherman was taking selfies back before some of you were born and certainly before the term had been coined. It's her first exhibition in, her, in Australia of uh, her large-scale photos made since uh, 2000. She's the master of masquerade. Her uh, own image is at the centre of the character studies that she's created over the decades uh, and it's fabulous. So get along to that. Uh, tonight we're talking about the new feminist frontier. Perhaps there should be a question mark there. Um, when the internet first arrived on the scene in the 1990s, it was a very blokey environment. But uh, since then, with the mainstreaming of cyberspace and the growth of social media and gaming, uh, women have claimed their rightful place in the digital space. Uh, but while women are now prominent online and in the arena of technology, this prominence has come at a cost. Online abuse, threats and harassment are not uncommon. Some of the guests tonight will be speaking about this from first-hand experience. Rape threats, death threats, threats to children, misogyny, the online sphere at its worst can be a terribly ugly place indeed. Uh, there will be some strong language tonight and there will be some uh, adult themes, so please take what I've just said as a warning if, uh, if that stuff offends you. Uh, someone recently described Twitter to me as a sewer, so uh, how do we change all of this? Um, and what are some of the positive stories for women in the technology space? Because there are plenty of those as well. That's the terrain we'll be covering tonight. These GOMA Talks sessions are presented in partnership between Quagoma and ABC RN. It's been a wonderful collaboration over the years and I'm sure tonight will be a terrific conversation. Uh, and it's being recorded for my show Big Ideas on RN, so it'll appear on the radio and on the podcast in weeks to come. Goma Talks is interactive. You can take part in the discussion here in the live audience at Goma by tweeting, or if you're watching via the live stream, uh, tweet your comments and questions to the hashtag Goma Talks or SMS us at 04888 Talks. We'd uh, love to include some of your perspectives and questions tonight. Okay, let me introduce the fabulous panel of guests tonight. On my right, Dr. Emma Jane, an author, senior research fellow and senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales. On my left is Dr Melinda Rackham, artist and author. Next to Melinda, we have Dr Nicholas Souza, associate professor at the Faculty of Law at QUT and uh, joining us via Skype in San Diego because uh, this of course is a panel on technology. We have Alana Pierce, writer, presenter, associate editor, toys and culture at IGN Entertainment. Please make our guests welcome. So, Emma, you were in a previous life a columnist for a newspaper. You Many hundreds of years ago. Indeed, yep. under the name Emma Tom, you wrote back in those That's days. That's right. Uh, then you became an academic and journalist. Uh, you were writing for newspapers at that time when newspapers decided to experiment with the online technology and attach the email addresses of their journalists at the bottom of the article. Um, tell us about what happened then and the type of comments that you got. Okay, so I was writing columns um, from the perspective of a sort of late 90s riot girl, third wave feminist, gonzo person. Um, I, I got a lot of um, traditional hate mail that arrived in dead tree form. It was always showed beautiful penmanship. <laughs> um, it used phrases like, you know, I was accused of espousing unbridled licentiousness. Um, so ma many of these letters came in, they, they were not happy with my work. They said they'd written asking that I be sacked and that they, they would cancel their subscription if I wasn't sacked. So not 
positive letters, but not certainly no threats of suggestions that uh, you know gang rape would serve as a sort of useful corrective. Mm. Um, but then, from about 1998, I started had the great idea of putting my email address at the end of my column like everyone does that mm. these days. <laughs> um, and the moment the email address went on, the quantity and the the, the type of material changed dramatically and um, I, I call it rape glitch. Mm. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genre. Mm. And it became so full on actually that it was a big factor in you deciding to leave journalism, leave being a columnist and become an academic. It was a factor because I was used to mining my personal life for commentary mm. and once I had a child uh, the, the, the threats of sexual violence arrived not just directed at me but directed at my child naming her and I couldn't handle that mm. and so I stopped writing about my life and I lost interest in that style of, of writing. Mm. I think we're going to be talking a lot tonight about online abuse, online threats, harassment, e bile, I think is a term that you use to describe this. Uh, and it's all very generalised when you use those terms. So I just wanted to put some things on the table to let people know about the type of abuse that we're actually talking about. This is the part of the evening that could get a little bit unpleasant. Uh, but can you just give us an idea of yes. some of the stuff you've been exposed to? Yes, so to? I've, I've brought along my very first um, emailed kind of rapey, my, my very first rapey email that I got back in around 1998. And um, I'll read it out to you. And I think the interesting thing about this for me as a researcher is that the material that I'm looking at 20 years later is all but identical. That's being sent to women in completely different circumstances all over the world. And it's all, it reads like exactly the same email. So this was my first one. You should have a good ass F word lasting two hours every day. That would set you right. You look like a tart, desperate for cock, or maybe you think you're cool or funky. All feminists should be gang raped to set them right, plus work in a whorehouse for a year or, or so, with whorehouse spelt H O R E. Which, you know, <laughs> whole, oh, you know, the worst kind. <laughs> so that, that was the first one, and again, the, the, the rhetoric. The rape glitch is identical mm. when I look at material that uh, is sent to sort of, you know, Catholic women bloggers in the UK. Mm. It just sounds like the same guy. Mm. Um, you know, which he's been incredibly prodigious if it is. Yeah. Hey, Alana, can I come to you um, on Skype? Because you've been the subject of some abuse and harassment yourself. Perhaps you could just give us an idea of uh, why you were targeted and uh, how bad the abuse and, and trolling was f of you? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, first things first, I hate the question why. People will always say, what did you say? Or what is that in response to? Or why is it happening to you? And, and my response to that is always, I don't know this person. I have absolutely no idea what specifically it was. And I've never spoken to them before. Uh, there's almost never an actual reason that, that someone mm. will say something to me. Um, it also varies a lot. Uh, it'll be com people complaining that there aren't boobs in videos that I'm in. Uh, it'll be someone threatening to rape me with a cactus. For some reason, I don't know. It could be maybe I played a video game and spoke about it and they didn't like it. And then more recently, I'm on a lot of podcasts and I'm getting people saying um, that I look miserable or I don't smile enough. And uh, I think that is actually just an expectation that they have of me as a woman, as opposed to all of the, the men that I'm on podcasts with, they don't expect the same reaction. So there's half of it is, as you've already established, rape glitch. I really like that. I feel like that's very apt when people are just very, very angry and I don't usually know what about. And then another half of it is just a lot of uh, very unrealistic expectations that I look a certain way, act a certain way. And if I don't do those things, uh, because I'm a woman, I'm just not good enough and I have to change, basically. And so is it just water off a duck's back when you get this stuff coming through? Does it have an effect on you? Uh, how, do you how do you respond to it? Uh, the sad state is now it happens so much that it means absolutely nothing to me. Um, at first, it really, really upset me. I remember the first time that I worked very hard on making a video that I was very proud of, and I got a lot of people just complaining that they couldn't see my cleavage in the comments. And I was really upset by that because I'd worked so hard. And to get that response just 
completely dismisses all of that effort. But um, now it's so common that it means absolutely nothing. Uh, my usual response is block, delete, and laugh, which is probably the best solution, is to make fun of the awful stuff people say. And giving them the attention a lot of the time can, uh, I think, give them satisfaction. Mm. But on the flip side of that, if it's a child, I will always treat it differently. Um, mm. Because shockingly, a lot of the people who send particularly sexually aggressive things can be very young people, which is... When I figured that out, I was very surprised because I always expected these to be coming from adult men. But a lot of them are young boys who have no idea what they're saying. So those, uh, I will try to contact their parents or contact their school or we'll find come to that. someone. We'll come yeah, to the. Uh, we'll find we'll come... someone in their social network to to address it, basically. Uh, and just before I bring uh, Nick and Melinda into the conversation, uh, Emma, how common? is this, uh, are, are these examples that we've just heard tonight? It's crazy common. Um, so, the, so the United Nations um, put a report out last year that pulled together a lot of research in this area, found that 73% of women and girls had experienced it personally or witnessed it. Women 27 times more likely to be abused or harassed online than men. It's part of the daily experience of using the internet while female for most of us. Yeah, and particularly bad if you happen to also be a female of colour, you know, also mm. have any other aspect of your life that generally gets abuse, you'll cop it even worse. Now, Melinda, you were an early adopter of the internet. You were online back in the 90s. Um, and back then, as I said in the introduction, it was very much a male-dominated space. What was it like to be a woman online in the, in the 90s when the web came along and there was all of this utopian dreaming about what the, what the web could be? It was absolutely fantastic, actually. It was like, like a rift had opened in the fabric of society for a moment. Now, like The internet had been around for about 20 years already, but browser technology just came in in, um, in 1994 and all of a sudden people could make their own web pages. So it was yeah, a space where ordinary everyday people like you and me could, could do stuff which couldn't happen before. I mean there's ham radio and things like that but actually filling up a, um, a public space with your stuff was, was new. Hard to imagine now mm. but it was really new uh, at that point. I was doing an MA in... in interactive media and gender studies at the time, and I was doing a lot of research into pornography, into um, computer viruses, into the, the culture of the internet as it was at that stage. And there are a lot of horrible, sleazy, dark alleys in the net where you could, you could actually get anything you wanted in terms of sex and violence and things you'd never heard of before. And I went to a lot of those for research purposes. Um, and, and I met a lot of really odd people, but I never knew who they really were, mm. and I never knew if they really meant what they were saying. Anonymity is the key thing here, Anonymity isn't it? Anonymity is the key thing, yeah. So, so it could be terrifying, and I did get quite scared, but I didn't know if they were people enacting fantasies who were, who were prim and proper in real life. Was there a point at which you noticed things changing? Online, things getting worse for women? Um, not really. I, uh, for me, the internet, uh, the World Wide Web, just really, it, it just really replicates the mm. real world. So that you know, I think things are pretty terrible for women <laughs> in this social space. The the web is just a really uh, a constructed space, like mm. any other social space, where. Um, you know, women are constantly harassed. Mm. Women don't get the top jobs. Women, yeah, women are subject to abuse from a very early age. Yes, uh, Nick, all of this points to cyberspace having a governance problem, I would have thought. Uh, does it have a governance problem when it comes to how women are treated online? I think all of this um, suggests that, yes, we do have really important governance questions that need to be addressed. Uh, fundamentally, the conversation we're having here is about what, so what we want our shared online social spaces to look like. And uh, to, so far, the way that they're governed 
hasn't, doesn't really seem to align with the values that we might have. Now, mm. this is a really complex space. Mm. The, the platforms that provide the social spaces where we communicate, they're all private organisations. They're governed by their terms of service. Uh, these are consumer transactions where we don't get a lot of say in how they're governed. But mm. I think there's a big demand here and it's growing uh, for really a new social contract about how we might like these spaces to be governed a in the future. Any thoughts about how the big players could lift their game? I mean, by the players, I suppose we're talking about uh, the telcos and the ISPs to start with, and then the big platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and so forth. So there's a couple of um, issues that make this a really complex question. Um, one of them is the sheer size of uh, the content that's being transmitted, the sheer quantity of material. Uh, Google's fond of trotting out the statistics about YouTube, that there are hundreds of hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute, that it's prohibitively expensive for them to regulate what people say. And there's a, there's a big rhetoric and a big discussion about the efficiencies. We don't want necessarily to create a system where we can't have these services. Mm. But at the same time, there are clear rights at stake. There are clear uh, human rights of, of privacy and of expression that are at stake here that we really need to find some way to deal with. Um, 2009, Facebook experimented with a form of democracy. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg came out and uh, uh, after a particularly um, violent um, incident when they tried to change the privacy terms of service, promised that Facebook terms of service would be the governing document that we as Facebook users would live by and we would have some input into that process. Um, it didn't last long, but I think these are the sorts of questions about agency and about what role users have in shaping these commercial platforms that we just haven't had yet. We don't have the language yet to have that discussion. So do you think we need new laws to regulate cyberspace, new forms of regulation? Uh, because, of course, when the web first opened, it was seen as this bastion of free expression and independence and uh, and even even moderation was frowned upon in the early days so are laws the answer or is it about somehow applying pressure on these big monoliths to be better uh, corporate citizens I think there's a bit of both at play here so there are already laws that exist to target individual offenders there's a there's quite broad criminal sanctions that exist uh, and uh, and potentially civil actions as well, but they're not enforced. Mm. Uh, so there are many, many stories, and the, the other panellists will be much better placed uh, than me to, to elaborate, but stories of just trenchant disinterest from law enforcement agencies when people come to them, victims come to them with allegations of breach. So. On the, vic on the individual level, I think that there is some role for law to play. Um, but the broader question is we're dealing with big social issues here and laws against individuals aren't terribly good at shifting large social norms at a massive scale. Mm. So I think it is, um, at the f in that first instance at least, about trying to find a way to have a more productive dialogue with the providers, the, the platforms who provide these spaces, to work out how we might build in better social norms, better systems to regulate mm. how, what people can say and how they can say it, better systems to have complaints escalated, dealt with more quickly, more transparently, mm. more efficiently. I think that's where we need to look at next. Mm. Uh, Alana, you've taken on the trolls yourself, taken on the abusers, the men who abuse you. Uh, as you said before, uh, it might appear as if this abuse is coming from middle-aged men, but you, in fact, discovered that some of the abuse that was levelled at you online, terrible abuse, actually was coming from young, young men, you know, scarcely more than boys, really. And as you said, you actually contacted the mothers of the boys who made these online threats to you. Uh, remind us about um, roughly what they said and then what you did next. Uh, so the specific incident that I tweeted about while this has happened a while, there was one that I tweeted about that picked up traffic and it was uh, a boy who I think was 10, I don't remember now, um, said, I will rape you if I ever see you and then the C word. 
And uh, I, I had no idea what this was in response to. It was just a private message on my Facebook page. I had absolutely no idea why he was saying that. And then I clicked on his profile and saw that he was surprisingly young. I would think almost or definitely too young to even know the impact of those words. Uh, so I decided, you know, if someone's very young, I think that they still have an opportunity to learn and it's also very, very easy to hold them accountable for things being that they literally have guardians. So uh, I found his mother via his Facebook profile very, very easily. She was listed in family. I screenshotted what he said and then I forwarded her the message and very cautiously asked her to um, address it and perhaps try and correct his behavior or teach him what he was saying was incorrect. And I've done this pretty much every time this has happened ever since and every time that I've actually been able to find uh, families and I've contacted schools at some point as well. And um, I, I just think it's a very good way to make people accountable for the things they do online. And speaking of laws, I do think that's the biggest issue is that people are still anonymous. People can say whatever they want and do whatever they want and never really get anything, any, any punishment for it or any real world consequences. And that seems to be the way that you stop this kind of thing from happening. So is that now your go-to tactic when this happens to you? I mean, it's definitely my go-to for uh, young people and that's, you know, it's more that I, I want to help them or I want them to uh, correct their behaviour rather than that I'm offended or particularly hurt by what they've said because being so young, I don't really think they know what they're saying. I think they're probably just, in a terrifying way, just trying to act like men and maybe that's what they think men say and they're, they're trying to seem bigger than they are. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to adults, um, yeah, my option is still always to just block, delete, and try and remove them from every single account that I can find them on, basically, so they can't keep saying stuff to me. Emma, as uh, Alana has shown there, women are fighting back against uh, misogyny online via, via various means. Uh, uh, fem feminist vigilantism, which... Um, I think it's called digilantism. Yeah, uh, so I've written about this a bit. Mm. I've written about um, Alana's case uh, as a case study in, academic, um, in an academic journal. Um, I call it digilantism, so mm. it's, the, it's uh, vigil vigilantism in the online sphere. Um, it's becoming increasingly common because it's one of the few things that women can do. Um, I've got issues with it. I think it puts a really unfair burden on people like Alana who are being targeted. Um, this is the kind of thing that we should be able to outsource. Like imagine if you were being harassed in real life and it was your job to track down the attacker and you know, go and speak to, to him or his guardians. Um, I, I feel that the... So Alana's being really um, humble when she said that that picked up a bit of traffic. It was covered uh, in international media. Mm. Uh, it was it, it, her actions, um, amazing actions, received extraordinary media coverage, and I really support her actions. I had a big problem with the media coverage because time and time again, and it, in dozens and dozens of times, the headline or the first line would be, "We have found the perfect solution to online harassment." So I, I have a big problem with that kind of framing. Mm. where women um, like Alana who are in a position, you know, she's kind of doing a social service. She's filling a gap mm. in, you know, the, the criminal justice system and corporations and governments are failing in terms of upholding their end of the social contract. Yeah. I think it's an unfair burden to put on women and it's just, you know, the, the, we don't have the hours in the day to be doing this stuff. Well, there's contacting the parents, but then there's going a step further, as people like Clementine Ford uh, has done, and that is contacting the employers of the men who have levelled the abuse at you. And in some cases, this, had, this has led to the men being sacked yeah. from their job. Uh, what about that as, as, as an approach? Just tackling them head on, and they are facing the consequences of what they've said. Look, I like that people are being held accountable for what they're doing online, but I think that, and, and I have so much admiration for the courage of these women, um, but I think it puts them in a really risky position. Mm. Like, they tend to get so much more abuse when they call out these guys. I've interviewed 50 women as part of my ongoing research. One of them uh, goes, once, <laughs> goes several steps further. She tracks them down 
she calls them up, she calls their partners, and she turns up at their workplaces mm. and confronts them. <laughs> now, Jenna Price mm. is, you know, a, is a ferocious individual, mm. and I, I, I can see that, um, you know, it works for her, but I, I think that I wouldn't advise that. Yeah. Uh, and, and Jenna doesn't advise that other women follow suit either. It could go wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, you, you don't have to have much of an imagination, Nick, to appreciate that if, if it's put back into the lap of people who've been abused to police the abusers, not only does that seem rather unfair, but there could be some pretty nasty consequences that could result. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I really love Emma's work on, on this, particularly um, the, the point that one of the reasons people are so happy to, to find this as a response is because every other system has failed. Um, but I am worried, more generally, um, there's, a, there's an excellent book by John Ronson called uh, um, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, right. and it tells this really heartbreaking story of when this type of vigilantism goes wrong and when the entire wrath of uh, uh, Reddit and Twitter can be brought down trying to seek justice on an individual who was misunderstood or take quoted out of context. And, uh, I think that's the other side of this coin that we need to be really careful about. These actions can destroy lives. Mm -hmm. Getting quite a few tweets coming through on this, actually, and one of the tweets that, that we had was, you know, how do we go about resetting social norms on this type of behaviour? Any, any thoughts, Melinda, about what we, what we do? I mean, you said before that, in a sense, the online world is a replica of society and to some extent that's true in that we know misogyny exists in the digital world and in in the real world but i still think people think they have a license to say things online that they would never say in in the real world how how do we change attitudes around that oh i think i think part of it's what uh, what emma is talking about uh is that making making abuse visible, first of all, making inequality visible, making, just making stuff visible, because when it's hidden, it, it festers and grows. Mm. I've, been, I've been following this uh, great, great uh, monthly discussion on the Empire List this month, talking about feminist data visualisation, mm -hmm. and it's looking at, you know, those structures and how the web is actually a constructed space. And I mm. think especially, you know, in here with the Cindy Sherman show where yep. everything is constructed, yes. it's a really great um, a really great opportunity to talk about, yes, the web's constructed of language. Mm. Language is never neutral. Coding language is never neutral. Uh, human computer interfaces are never neutral. Mm. And data is power and mm. power replicates itself in a lot of ways. Um, so the idea to look at who owns the data, who assesses it, and who interprets it. There was a great um, there was a great study by Carnegie Mellon University last year, where they looked at Google AdWords. You know how you're browsing around, and Google will throw up, you know, what they think you want to see. Um, so some researchers stumbled across something that looked a bit odd. So what they did was they created a thousand simulated users, half male, half female, and sent them off to the top 100 job sites um, on the internet. And it turned out that the male users were shown ads for jobs that paid over $200,000 a year, six times more than women were. So that if a woman went to the site, she wouldn't be shown that ad. So, uh, it, you know, there's an inequality in the smart software that makes those decisions. So it's not even... So it's an people. algorithm. Yeah, uh, it's an so, algorithm. So if, what you're saying is if you switched your po profile to male, you would get jobs offered to you that paid yes. hundreds of thousands of yes. dollars more than if you remained yeah. female. Yeah. And this is... And this is this is why we have to look at data. We have to look at the actual construction. Like, there was also that um, Google did it with its photo app as well, where it was labeling, labeling African American users as their photos as gorillas, because it was oh. it was like 
you know, they apologised, but of course it was because they were using, you know, a white biased, mm. uh, white biased software. Which is exactly what happens offline, you know, yeah. unconscious bias, like, yeah. you know, even women looking at job applicants will rate those that have a female yes. name lower than exactly yeah. the same ones with a male name. Like, mm. yeah. we, you know, it's no great surprise that the internet reflects what's yeah. happening you know, in this world, but I do, I, I think that, that there's an, the extremeness of the mm. language mm. and that we're seeing online and, you know, a recent example was Leslie Jones with the Ghostbusters. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, I hate the word trolling, like calling those people trolls seems to just let them off way too easy. Let's give a bit of context on that. So uh, there's a remake of the movie Ghostbusters. Uh, it's an all-female remake of Ghostbusters, which has got up the noses of some blokes who see this as a feminist reworking of a... Well, I don't actually Part know what... Part of the what, great feminist conspiracy the, the feminist to take conspiracy. over the world yeah. by being incredibly subjugated in every aspect and of our lives. And one of the actors, uh, Leslie Jones, is uh, not only a female, she happens to be African-American as yeah. well. So in the way the, this, these things work, in the social media space, that makes her particularly a target, right? Yeah, and I mean, so there's this idea, okay, that if you're a celebrity, you're kind of up for it or asking for it or whatever, but the kind of material that she was getting, the volume of it, and the absolutely horrendous language, you know, like horrendous language, it's not just ba bad language, it is violent language, and it's absolutely incredibly racist and she was becoming increasingly distressed on Twitter as she kept trying to draw attention to this stuff and point it out and you could see her interacting with uh, you know executives at Twitter um, but eventually she withdrew from Twitter herself and then in the last 24 hours Twitter has permanently banned a very prominent right-wing uh, media commentator from the platform permanently uh, for basically, you know, inciting some of these mass attacks. And this is, this is unprecedented, this action that Twitter has taken. I don't know if banning someone permanently is unprecedented. But a high profile... But, yeah, uh, to, to remove a high, very high profile media commentator, uh, I, I'm not... Nick, I mm. don't know if you've heard of anything similar, but it seems to be a precedent. It's a, it's a very big step. For, for many years, Twitter has been working on changing its image. It has promised, made promises that it hasn't been able to keep yet, uh, that it was going to do something to deal with abuse on its network. And so we've seen a transformation of Twitter over the last five years from a company that uh, claims to be the, the free speech wing of the free speech party to a company that finds itself wedged on how to actually deal with this abuse day to day on its network. But I think the bigger point here is is, is, the, is the great point that you made is that these systems are never neutral. Yes, we have... Uh Obviously, they reflect patterns of discrimination that exist in real world, in, in the physical world, but we're embedding them in code. We're embedding them in algorithms that process content on a scale that is unimaginable. We're embedding them in language, terms of service, and decisions that are made by minimum wage employees in developing countries that are made without any transparency mm. or due process. And we've mm. created this giant machine that works on rules to amplify these existing patterns of discrimination. And that's what we really fundamentally need to address. Alana, I've just got a tweet come in that says, uh, extreme and violent language is everywhere online. Some of the things I've heard people nonchalantly say in games is horrific. Uh, tell us a bit about the world of gaming culture and how gendered it is. Uh, playing video games online as a woman basically means that you either get one of two things. You have people hit on you a lot even though they can't see you <laughs> and the only thing that they would know of you is that you are currently playing a video game or you have people um, use really, really gendered slurs against you for being a woman who is playing a game. Um, and it seems like the idea for that is that it's some kind of boys club and that they 
detest the idea that there's someone else there or it's that you're an easy target. There's something that is obviously different about you being that you're the only woman in the lobby, so they're going to make fun of you for it. And um, that is definitely a huge thing. And I feel like the Ghostbusters uh, situation with Leslie Jones does seem to be a kind of spin-off of that in that it's... That's when those movies came out, they were very popular, but it's still a kind of nerdy thing to like Ghostbusters. And that ties in with uh, video games and people seem to be getting angrier as video games are changing and more women are working in games and uh, more games are being made for women. People tend to get angry about that because I think it's the idea that when you've had something that has been made for you for so long and majority of our video game protagonists are white, straight men, uh, you watching something change to start to cater to other people is probably terrifying. So the reaction to that seems to be to abuse women who... I, I feel like the diversity is a good thing. I think diversity in any entertainment media makes us smarter and more critical as people. But um, I think it's just all complete fear, basically. So, Alana, are the number of uh, female game developers growing? And with their growth, are they gaining more acceptance? And are they changing the nature of the type of games that are now available? Uh, yes, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> there are definitely more women in games and stuff like Ghostbusters coming out and I, I saw that over the weekend and the movie's fine but seeing four women, there's an end fight scene where there's just four women with these guns killing these ghosts, just completely kicking butt. The only people who saves them are each other. Seeing that kind of thing, maybe if I had have seen that as a kid, I would have felt inspired by that. The same thing happened with Star Wars. It's like, wow, I wish I had a protagonist like Rey, the lead character in the last Star Wars movie, when I was a kid to look up to. And I think that's happening a lot with game development as well. It's it's someone uh, who's a woman develops a game and then someone else sees that and is like, hey, I can actually do that when previously you might never have considered it. And I think the same thing happens in my line of work where uh, I do stuff that's very public for the company that I work for and then a girl might contact me and say, hey, I hadn't even thought that I could do that because I kind of just assumed it was all men, so maybe I can. So it's that's step one, I think, is people realizing that they can exist in industries that are still male-dominated and that it will level out eventually. Um, but probably one of the best parts is the different kinds of games that are coming out. And it's not even just that uh, women are making them, it's that women are inspiring men to make different games also. Mm. So there's uh, games that deal with... Um, that Dragon Cancer is a really good example of a game. It's basically uh, an empathy story about someone dealing with the loss of a family member due to cancer. And it's r just a really strong empathy game that makes something like that that certain people might not relate to really relatable. And that kind of thing being influenced by women just makes the whole culture a lot more broad, diverse, and um, empathy is the biggest thing. It's, it's giving people who play games more empathy. Mm. Emma, uh, yeah, oh, just and then, and then a couple Melinda. of things on the statistics around yep. women and gaming. Like yep. in the States, 50% of gamers are female now. Yep. So uh, make up half the gaming population. But unfortunately, the number of women working in computing and tech in the States is dropping. So it's less than what it was mm -hmm. like 10 years ago. And the reasons for that are around the incredibly entrenched misogyny and chauvinism in those tech workplaces where, where the games are being designed and made and marketed. And there's been some amazing uh, media coverage given to individual female games designers uh, and developers that you know, I do it exactly as Lalana says, amazing role representation and role models mm. for younger women, but it's coming at a really big cost to those women mm. that are getting the publicity. And unfortunately, overall, women are slipping in that area in terms of representation in the workforce in mm. the States. Mm. Melinda, you've been a gamer for years, haven't you? No. No? No. <laughs> I haven't, but I've curated games and written about okay, games. Okay, you've been involved in the gaming so space I'm, I'm then for a, a while. I'm just a little bit of a twiddler, okay. really. Um, there's always been other sorts of games besides, you know, aggressive first-person shooters, always. Yep. Um, and I guess they haven't gotten the traction that, that violent, aggressive games have. Um, there's been a lot of development in... Australia was a really big space for art games. Mm. Uh, there was a group called Select Parks who made a game 
that was based in the Acme building in Federation Square where the, the users had these beautiful light balls that they threw and you could coordinate to make sort of visual and sound works. So it was absolutely, it was riveting. Wow, it yeah. was beautiful. Um, so it was a multiplayer location based game. Mm. Um, there was, you know, Escape from Woomera, who can forget that? That's right. Um, and then there's Tale of Tales, the Belgian couple who make these beautiful, awe-inspiring games where you wander through enchanted forests or graveyards or mid-century modern houses, exploring and discovering and looking for things. But they just went out of business last month because they're not getting the sales that, mm. that other forms of uh, gaming. And in terms does. of actually women taking action, I heard of, and you might know more about this, I'm not sure, a Los Angeles artist who got all of the dick pics that had been sent to her unsolicited <laughs> and created an artwork out that's of it. That's great, no. Um, have no. you heard about that? I haven't, yeah. but Whitney it's Phillips. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah Whitney that's Phillips, great. yeah, and she's got a, you can Google her and see this lovely yeah. assortment. <laughs> she, there's 150 of them. And who would have thought when we started creating the internet that, uns that unsolicited genital photos were, was going to become a thing? Like, I don't I honestly, <laughs> like, uh, you it's know... It's the, the first time and then it's just like, oh, yeah. The what, dick what pics yeah. were going to become uh, the new, f you know, one of the many new faces of harassment. And I wonder, I just don't know any, I don't think I know any men... That, that would do this. What is this, like what is this about? I, well, I, men, men have been very disinterested in their penises, as we know, you know, they don't yeah. talk about them, they don't think about them. I can only presume <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> hashtag bit of sarcasm. Um, um. If I was going to be cruel, I'd actually get Nick to respond to it, but uh, <laughs> maybe I won't. <laughs> but you never know if they're men, really. That's the other thing. Uh, 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 if you look at <laughs> Clem Ford's pin-up gallery of unsolicited yeah. dick pics, it's, you know, the, ca the camera angle seems to be... <laughs> but you never know if it's, it's that men, man's. That yes. man that's sending them. Yeah. Mm. We are getting a lot of uh, tweets, actually. Any yeah. dick pics? But yeah. no dick pics. <laughs> I'm not sure whether someone's self-censoring the feed that I'm getting here or, uh, or not. But uh, a lot of the tweets relating to this issue, really, Nick, that is troubling people, this tension between free speech and what we do about changing the discourse. And as you've said, this is the kind of pointy end where things are complex and really there is no simple answer to this, is there? Yeah, there absolutely isn't, Paul. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for freedom of speech. Um, we worked very hard in Australia to stop the uh, government's, the Labor government's proposal for mandatory internet filtering just six, seven years ago. Um, but the important point to realise, I think, is again to make the point that none of, there is no such thing as an uncensored internet. Yep. When you're talking about the harassment that arrives through various channels, they're mediated through often social media platforms. And there are decisions that are made, either consciously or baked into the software, about what sort of content becomes visible, yep. what sort of content percolates to the top of yep. um, <laughs> your... <laughs> <laughs> the content that... Um, <laughs> I don't know what else to say at this point. <laughs> So there are always decisions that are I made. should actually oh. clarify to the radio audience that that was in response to a tweet that read, whenever I receive an unsolicited dick pic, I send back a photo of Dick Smith. <laughs> I suppose it's funny. Um. So the decision we have here is not one between perfect freedom and uh, one between perfect censorship. It's a question about how, who makes those rules. Yep. And the way they're currently made, they grow up out of bro culture in Silicon Valley. They're made... this, this is the question then. Okay, so it's not about laws and, uh, and there's no such thing as an unregulated uh, space online. The question then is, can we feminise social media? And here's, here's some examples. Earlier in the year, Facebook's community standards team decided that a meme that depicted and mocked a, vi a victim of domestic violence didn't actually violate the site's guidelines. On the other hand, when Clementine Ford told a troll to F off, uh, which 
by the standards of abuse that surround Twitter is pretty mild stuff. Uh, she was banned for a month. There's a bit of a double standard happening here. Absolutely, and that's the conversation that we need to have. Um, I, I think that there's a lot we can learn. A, a feminist ethics of care approach to how we make and enforce these rules can teach us quite a lot, I think. In the, at the moment, these rules are, are enforced. They're created out of a particular cultural uh, identity. They're enforced mechanically by, as I mentioned earlier, uh, minimum wage employees, and they're rife with bias. They are biased towards a certain image of what is acceptable and what is not. Mm. And we see this all the time, whether it's breastfeeding photos yep. that are banned on, Twitter, on Facebook um, or the, the very, very disparate uh, responses to abuse, or depending on where it comes from. Someone posted something on uh, breast cancer awareness and mm -hmm. similar thing. They got banned and the post got taken down. And I saw yesterday someone, um, post, a, a Melbourne singer posting about period pain, was banned on, on Facebook. Um, how, is the, how is this happening? What, what are the mechanics behind those decisions occurring? Is it, a, is it an algorithm that's kind of lifting stuff automatically or is there a guy up there who's pressing the button? Uh, <laughs> I think it's probably neither of those things and it's much more complex. So there, there are algorithmic considerations here. There's a, there's a flag button and certainly the number of people who hit that report um, button beneath a post is something that's taken into account in the, in the system. Then there are, there are literally armies of people whose job it is to sort through the worst of the worst content that's posted on massive social networks and determine, according to a quite mechanistic formula, whether or not that content is permitted or not. Those decisions are completely opaque. We have no idea how they're made. Mm. And then there's a separate layer on top of that that in order to cut costs or potentially um, remove some of the human decision making here. We're using now Facebook um, in particular has developed new machine learning systems, artificial intelligence that is able to enforce these rules with very minimal human oversight. How they work, what their error rate is, we have no idea. Mm. Facebook is a private company. They're not obliged to tell us any of that information. Mm. And we have no fundamental um, transparency about what's going on. And that's the first step. Mm. Alana, any thoughts on how we feminise the internet? I mean, first things first, I just really wanted to share my tactic for responding to dick pics, which is to oh, send okay. back someone else's slightly larger dick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funnily enough, I'll be like, why did you send me that? And I'll just copy and paste it and reply with that. <laughs> uh, that that's called well. fi fighting fire with fire, I think. Yeah, it seems to go down pretty well. Um, I think there are a lot of very good spaces for uh, feminists on the internet and there are a lot of uh, collectives where people can support each other. Supporting, but, but uh, sorry, feminizing the internet as a whole, again, means needing more women in the industry and I do feel like a lot of the things like Facebook bans are a group of people behind a computer working on a policy that was probably created by a man uh, who are forced to say yes and no to certain things um, without... A, a woman's input. It's mm. for an example, uh, the house that I currently live in uh, doesn't have any bathrooms that have mirrors that have lights on top of them. And there's, there's just all of these things that when you talk to someone about it, it's like, you know what happened when this house was built? A woman never walked through it. There's no, none of the closets are big enough. All of the lighting is really bad. The kitchen's very unorganized. It's just like the entire thing is like a woman never walked through this house. And that's the, the exact same problem is that we need more women in the field who can address things and speak for other women uh, before that can happen. And uh, I feel like I am a woman working in a field that is very male dominated and, and can be very awful for that. But at the same time, the encouragement that you get from male colleagues and female colleagues for doing that makes it so worthwhile. Uh, mm. All of the men that I work with are so, so, so supportive. And anytime there's any kind of uh, issue of sexism that we have to deal with or decide if we want to publish a story or not that is in some way related to feminism or sexism, there is a discussion where women are brought into a room and senior editors are, we will sit there and say we want to listen to your opinion and uh, it's it's so valuable so I think just please if you have ever thought about working in a any kind of tech industry, please do it and know that there is a huge support network for you and with every one of you who does that that support network grows and I think that's basically how we change the internet. Uh, yeah, I, I would, I, 
Sorry, go ahead. There is a great network called FemTechNet, which is women artists and scholars and um, technologists and students around the world who want to increase women's digital literacy. So they run free online courses for women. They do semi you know, located space seminars to teach women digital skills. Mm. And they also do things like they run wiki storming events where you get together for the day and put more women into Wikipedia and get more women oh. editing. Because, you know, something like 9% of the people editing Wikipedia are women. Mm. So it's like to just to try and, you know, it's the old 70s feminist call of, you know, 50% representation. It actually makes a difference. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point, actually. My new boss at the ABC is a former executive at Google, uh, a female. Um, proof that women can make it to the upper reaches of the digital business. But where are the female Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerbergs? I mean, we, in order to change this beast, I would have thought, Emma, need <laughs> people at the very, at the very top. Are we getting... Yeah, we've got more dick pics. We've, uh, we've, we've opened the can of worms on yeah. dick pics, haven't we? Literally a can uh. of worms. <laughs> I think the reason that women, the reason that women are, we do need more women. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just the regular glass ceiling problem. It's the in tech and computing industries, glass ceiling plus mega misogynist harassment in the workplace issue. And I'm so happy to hear that Alana's having a really good experience. Yep. Um, unfortunately, it is not true across the board that that is the experience of women in these fields. There is huge pushback. Mm. Um, and gee, isn't it interesting that in all of the discussion around why do we have this problem and what can we do about it, we, we're not talking about individual dudes. Mm. Like, like yeah. I, I, I'm like Alana, I refuse to say, well, well why, why is this happening? It's happening because dudes are sending this material. Men are writing these messages and sending them. So it, it, it's yep. like, yes, it'd be great to have different um, responses from platforms, different resp responses from legislators and policy makers, but I'm wondering how do we get the message through to the next, perhaps this generation of male internet users are lost to us? Well, it's a really but good... But the next generation, you know, that, that this is not an okay way to speak about women. People are going to, to extreme lengths to uh, to give you an example, there's an episode, some of you would have heard it in the audience, of This American Life, where a woman talks about being harassed by someone who's created a fake account he set up under her dead father's name. Uh, the cruelty involved in this is extraordinary. She has uh, previously received the types of abuse that we've heard discussed tonight, the, the rape threats and so forth, but this is over the line. The result for her is that she decides, against all of the advice, that she's going to contact the person who set up this fake account under her dead father's name. Uh, and the result is that she has a conversation with him that's recorded and broadcast on the program This American Life. So you get to hear someone confronting a guy. And the most striking thing about it is how banal he is how incredibly ashamed he is, how genuinely remorseful, I have to say, he feels. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's, it's eye-opening, not because you feel sympathy for him, um, but it's, it's all, all of a sudden your imagination of what these people are like uh, becomes, you know, you, you can see the person. And it does make me, I mean, I heard this program and I thought, what drives people to do this? He couldn't really articulate it himself. Yeah, so there was a really similar situation in Australia a couple of weeks ago. We've got two court cases that have been underway or have been concluded in which men have been charged uh, for abusing women online. And the one that was um, concluded the other week involved the former senator, Nova Paris. Yeah. And he, he pled guilty to the charge of using a carriage. The, the relevant charge in Australia is using a carriage service to harass, menace or cause offence. He pled guilty and he wrote her a letter, an apology letter that is readily available online and is really quite moving. Mm. 
And really interesting for the same reason, in that he said, I just don't know why I did it. Mm. And I wonder how often that is in fact true, that as this type of discourse becomes more and more normalised, you know, guys just participate, and maybe some girl, women as well. Mm. You know, it becomes, if you disagree with someone, you go straight to the rape threat. Mm. You go straight to the ultra-violence um, without thinking it through, thinking mm. about how those words might land, mm. that they indeed end up with another human mm. at the other end of the computer. It and it's, it's sort of like, you know, the prefrontal, the prefrontal cortex is turned off. It's like all the empathy is gone mm. um, as soon as you touch the keyboard, in a way. Well, it's also, it's also this it, um, yeah. latest tweet is really important, I think, about teaching young boys to define masculinity. Yeah. And that's, you know... It was, it was one of the yeah. questions I was going to try and squeeze in, the, yeah. the, the fact that men and women seem to engage and interact differently online. And I wonder whether that's something that you noticed in the, in the earlier days of, of the web, uh, that, that there were gendered ways of, of interacting, or is this something that's kind of grown and morphed in recent times? I think there's more people online now, and mm. it's a bigger social space. In the a mainstream space too, a I suppose. A mainstream social yeah. space, and I found, I found it very collegial in the beginning, mm. very collegial. Because it was sure a voluntary I'm, space, you didn't need yeah. to be online. And, um, and communities, communities self-regulated yeah. as well. Uh, if something went on, like the, the rape in Lamdamu in 1993 that we were talking about Tell earlier. Tell us about that. Uh, oh, Lamdamu, um, Lambda Moo was a, a multi-user space, a text-based multi-user space, so you had to use your imagination. It was sort of was described as you come into a living room and there are three doors going out and someone sitting on the lounge. So everything was happening in your own head and you, and you typed into it to be involved. People were, had characters in there and, um, and there was a character called Mr Bungle who... who had a piece of software called a voodoo doll that overtook other characters' players and made them perform sexual and violent acts on him and each other so that the people who owned those characters couldn't actually log off and could see themselves performing these acts and feeling violated and abused. And, and this was sort of the point of the loss of innocence of the internet, mm. I think, where the community got together and actually went, oh, we actually have to do something about self-regulation. And they banned Mr Bungle. They had a community meeting, banned Mr Bungle. And he came back a few days later under a different name, mm. which, of course, you know, <laughs> you mm. can't stop somebody coming back again. So that, that, yeah, that was the beginning. But I just read another study. I've been reading a lot of studies <laughs> for this panel about um, World of Warcraft. And, and apparently men have female avatars in their... 25% of the time, but only 8% of women go in as male avatars. Oh, yeah. And the way you can tell, the tells, the giveaways, are not actually about emotions or language. It's about unconscious body movements. The male avatars will stand further away from a group of females. Yeah. So the women will actually be actually physically closer, where men will, will, will have... More body Isn't space. Isn't that interesting? So it's a yeah. hand spread. Yes, I was going to ask. Yeah, <laughs> they like really <laughs> take up the virtual yeah. space. I don't, I don't think they get to sit a lot. But yes. I think the growth of the <laughs> of the uh, of the games that you were talking about, the empathy games, Alana, mm. is promising. A new kind of development, a new direction in which games are moving beyond the shoot 'em up driving very fast cars games that uh, have been popular over the years and do you think that's signaling uh the kind of maturity of the gaming culture and uh, some exciting kind of new feminized directions that we could see more of in the years to come uh this is actually totally relevant to the discussion you're having before about you know masculinity in feminism and what masculinity means as a part of feminism as well um so a lot of men won't play as a female character. So the argument is there aren't more female main characters in games because men won't play as them, but women don't care. Women will play as a man or a female character and don't care, but a man can't play as a woman without feeling like he's been emasculated, basically. Um, what seems to be happening right now is that 
people are pushing very, very hard. You know, there's nothing affects you quite as much as someone saying, hey, uh, my seven-year-old daughter has started playing games and she's getting more interested in mature games, but I'm trying to find things that have female lead characters for her to play as. And I feel like for every extra person who asks that question to a developer or a publisher, there's always a moment that's like, wow, I'm so sorry, that's so sad. So we're seeing a lot more female characters and right now uh, Marvel is doing a great job of that. As I mentioned before with Star Wars, their last two movies have had female protagonists um, so I think this is something that is changing and it's it's obviously going to have a pushback, as I said, with the issue of emasculation. And, you know, that's kind of why I think that people even send dick pics or do things and then say, I don't know why I said that. I feel like part of it might be that uh, masculinity is associated with being wanted by women and so they feel the need to act on something without even thinking that the person on the other end is a person. They just think, this is a woman and this is my job as a man and I'm not a real man if this woman doesn't want to <laughs> sleep with me. So it's just kind of a, a cycle that feminism also fixes, I think, is the way that that's dealt with. But um, yeah, to answer the question, it, it's definitely changing and we are seeing more women in games and I, I feel like that's yeah, it's going to keep getting better. Okay. I'm going to take that actually as a positive note and uh, because it's a positive note in a discussion that's been uh, resplendent with uh, quite depressing facts, uh, I will uh, wrap the discussion on that point. It's been a terrific chat. I want to thank all of you for coming along tonight for the first of the Goma Talks Cindy Sherman discussions and thanks to all of you who tweeted throughout. Sorry I couldn't get to more of your tweets and more of your questions. They were coming through so quickly actually that at one point I just couldn't even keep up with them. So uh, thanks for contributing. A reminder that tonight's Goma Talks discussion is the first of two and uh, the next discussion is being hosted by my colleague Sarah Konoski from RN's Books and Arts. It'll be on Thursday the 28th of July. So uh, get along to that. Uh, Sarah and her guests will be exploring feminism after the revolution. What's changed? What battles are still to be fought? What's the way ahead for 21st century feminism? Can you please uh, thank our guests tonight, Emma, Alana, Nick and Melinda. Uh, tonight's Goma Talks will be available to watch again, relive the highlights online at Quagoma TV through the gallery's website. As I say, it'll appear on RN, on my program, Big Ideas, and on the podcast in the weeks to come. So check that out. Thanks again for coming and have a great night. See ya.